recognize disease is based on symptoms and signs. You know, a, a symptom is the wilt, a sign is the fungus or the bacteria. Sometimes we need a microscope to see those signs, you know. But that's what I do when I go out and visit uh, a, a, an operation or if I've got research plots and I don't know what's causing it, I, I look for signs. On, and usually a lot of these things are microscopic. But sometimes you can use your eyes or a little hand lens to see these things. You know, there's a whole f class of non-infectious diseases. These are things like nutrient deficiencies or like Steve was talking about putting too much nitrogen next to that corn and, and, and frying it with fertilizer. Chemical injury, getting too close to your tomato plants with Roundup. Okay, that would be a, a chemical injury. I've done that in my garden. Soil, uh, you know, drought, or last May, for example, you know, in Stillwater, we had 17 inches of rain in May. You know, that's flooding soil conditions, really. The soil goes anaerobic and the plants just sit there and a lot of the roots will die from lack of oxygen so it slows things down. And they don't really spread from plant to plant. Uh, that's one of the unique things about that. Whereas a, a, an infectious disease caused by a microorganism will spread. Okay, this is probably the most famous one on tomatoes is blossom end rot. If you get a lot of this, you've either, you're not keeping the plants uniformly wet or moist, the soil moist, or you're growing non-adapted varieties. If you want to grow romas or those elongated uh, San Morenos or whatever they call them, don't try and grow them in Oklahoma because you're going to get 50% or more of them. Sometimes 100% of them will show these kinds of symptoms. And, and then this other one here, you know, a lot of times this is out of our control. I mean, uh, we got more cattle in Oklahoma than we got people. You know, and, and, and the ranchers are, are spraying herbicide on a lot of this pasture land to get all the broad leaves out of there, and that stuff moves around, and tomatoes are super sensitive. So if your tomatoes start twisting up like this, and they're all doing it, it's not just one or two, all of them, that's uh, phenoxy herbicide injury. Lawn cares, uh, pasture and lawn care, uh, the tomatoes are super sensitive and often all the plants are affected and it goes to the new growth that looks a lot like a virus. That's a tough one, you know. The other thing is a runoff with water or uh, hay. People are starting to grow plants in hay. You got to be careful where you get your hay because if it's been treated with Grazon P plus D, uh, I guarantee you stick tomatoes in that hay bale and try and grow them, they're going to twist up just like that. And now we got the diseases caught, and there's another one called leaf roll. I was looking for a picture of it earlier. You know, in wet, humid years, and often see it in July when it gets really hot and humid. The leaves of some varieties, you know, sometimes it'll be just the lower leaves, or uh, sometimes it'll be all the leaves, and they'll just roll up. And uh, they don't look real great, but I don't think it really affects the production all that much. But, but they'll stay rolled up. And these are the diseases that are caused by microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, viruses, nematodes, and they spread from plant to plant. Usually start in a few areas or on a few leaves in the plant and work their way up. Bacterial diseases, this is what bacteria looks like. It's just gooey stuff. This is xanthomonas. This causes bacterial spot on tomatoes and peppers. It's a little cartoon of what they look like, but sometimes they'll cause bacterial wilt. We don't have much of that here, fortunately, but sometimes you can diagnose it. You can see the signs of it. But this is typically, if somebody uh, gives me a leaf, tomato leaf or something, and they want to know what it is, I'll chop it up in a drop of water, put it under the microscope, and if you see all these, these little uh, uh, streams of bacteria coming out, you know you have a bacterial disease. These transplant production areas, greenhouse facilities will, will get, uh, get these bacteria in there and sometimes they're just growing on the surface and then you set them out in the field and the conditions become favorable and boom. Basically they got to get in the stomates. Th those are the pores on the bottom of the leaf and they'll kind of build up and then you'll get like, uh, they call them aerosols or windblown rain uh, or splash or whatever. And it, the, when, when those stomates are wide open, that's when those bacteria get in there. So that's bacterial speck. This is what I have in my garden. 
I've had it ever since I've grown tomatoes in there. Fortunately, it's the lesser of the evil. The spot's a little more aggressive. That's, this is bacterial spot. And you'll see these leaf diseases. Basically, you gotta see these brown spots, these little brown spots in the middle of the leaves. That gives you an idea it's a disease. Okay, if it's just the edges of the disease, uh, leaves rolling up, you know, it could be a lot of things. It could be something in the soil. Uh, it could be uh, nematodes in the soil. It could be wilt disease. But if you've got a leaf disease, you usually see these spots in the middles of the leaves. Here's another bacterial spot, and then it gets scorched up, lower leaves scorch, and you can get it on the fruit. Saw a lot of that two years ago, fruit spotting. Uh, Brett went out and collected a lot of samples. Then we have fungal diseases. This is what fungus looks like, just kind of mold. These are little pieces of leaf or stem that you put in a, on a Petri plate and it grows out. This is one we have in Oklahoma, mostly in the eastern part of the state around Bixby and further uh, south. But it's septorial leaf spot, looks a lot like bacterial spot. The spots are a little bigger, but when I chop those up and put them under the scope, you see these little needles coming out, and that's septoria. Uh, early blight. Uh, we have a little bit of this here. I've had it in my garden maybe once. I'll show you a picture of it when I had it in my garden. I think I brought it in on some potato plants, you know, some uh, potatoes that I brought because it showed up in the potatoes, and then next thing I know, it's, it's showing up on the uh, tomatoes. The key to identifying this thing is these are round spots. This is from my garden. But you'll see those big round spots about a half inch in diameter. And if you look at the close-up of those things, there's little rings in there. That's the way to identify early blight. And when you chop those up, you get this alternaria on there. And the key to the alternaria will grow on any, any dead leaf. Uh, just about, you'll find alternaria. But if it, ha it has to have these long, slender needles for it to be a plant pathogen. A lot of those are saprophytic, you know. But anyway, they just grow on dead and dying stuff. But the, the pathogenic ones have these long uh, beaks on them. Don't see much of this in Oklahoma. Even on potatoes, even on commercial potatoes, we don't see much. But basically all those foliar diseases that I just showed you work their way up from the bottom to the top of the plant. You'll see the symptoms first on the lower leaves. Talk about some stem diseases. This is normally a greenhouse disease or a hoop house disease, uh, but more typically greenhouse when you're uh, growing them in a low light environment and, and you're trying to heat the house and you're spending a lot of money on heat and you don't want to shoot all the heat out the side of the greenhouse and you build up a lot of moisture and condensation and the humidity runs real high. This is a problem in hydroponic greenhouses. Uh, probably the number one problem is this botrytis. It starts on these little pruning scars or dead leaves and it grows into the stem and it's called gray mold. Big problem in greenhouses. We had so much rain this year, this was my garden. That, believe it or not, uh, was botrytis in my garden. Killing stems and branches of my tomato plants. Uh, showed up in July after, what do we have, 20-something inches between, uh, between May and June. So, yeah, that was, uh, it was a tough year for tomatoes, at least at my house. Uh, this is another greenhouse disease we have, I've seen quite frequently in Oklahoma, is powdery mildew. I haven't really seen it in hoop houses, mainly in greenhouses. But it's got a wide host range. Anytime you shelter rain, you run the risk of getting this kind of powdery mildew in there. It's kind of a desert powdery mildew. It doesn't like rain. You put those spores under the scope and put them in water and they just, break, they just burst. So they like it on the dry side. They like high humidity but no, no water. So uh, that, that, that can occur. Most people use sulfur on this in greenhouses. Sulfur is very effective on powdery mildews. And we have fusarium wilt. This is a soil disease, and it gets in the roots, and then it causes this streak, these brown streaks in the stem, and that, and that streak will go up into the upper part of the plant, and oftentimes you'll get a yellowing on one side, but other times the whole plant will just wilt. 
and I'll talk more about this, but we control this mainly, you know, in Florida in the, in the uh, fresh market tomatoes, the, they fumigate for this. Um, uh, but there's, uh, uh, and, they, and when, they, when they grow these tomatoes down there, they, um, they start developing new races. There's resistance to fusarium wilt. I'll talk a little bit about that when you select tomato varieties. But, uh, you know, if you're in an intensive tomato producing area, you can overcome that resistance because the new strains develop. But typically with fusarium, you get yellowing before it withers and dies. And usually it's, it starts on one side of the plant. And then this other one here is this crown rot fusarium. This is a problem in hoop, in hoop houses and in hydroponics also. But I've seen it in hoop houses here in Oklahoma where uh, growers go into the, uh, they're planting in the ground. Okay, you know, the first year they get a good crop and then the second year, you know, these things just build up. Uh, I guess, uh, I don't know if they're brought in on plants or whatever, but uh, the, the discoloration doesn't go as high, but you often see this canker on the base of the plant. It's kind of a dry looking canker right there. And uh, he, last year, uh, uh, one of our growers there in Payne County has got two hoop houses. He had this really badly in, in one of his uh, hoop houses. The greenhouse varieties uh, like Trust, Trend, um, from like companies like DeRuder, they have resistance to this. But your field tomatoes don't. Your field tomatoes have resistance to this. So it's important to know which one you have, and it's not always easy to tell. But this is the good way to tell is this canker on the outside of the stem. And then we have a few viruses. Viruses are little submicroscopic particles. You can't even see those under the microscope. You need an electron microscope. So basically these are uh, uh, a little uh, DNA or RNA, and they're protected by a protein coat, and they come in different shapes. Uh, rod shaped and uh, round ones. And we, and we diagnose these with uh, uh, serological techniques, immunology. We have little test strips now, dipsticks. If we think we know what the virus is, we can uh, do a dips, dipstick test on it and uh, tell within 20, 30 minutes what, if, if that's the virus or not. Now, if we don't know what virus it is and we don't have the right dipsticks, we got to send it off to AgDIA and they'll run a virus screen on it. So we send it off to a commercial company that's got uh, all these different things. But viruses are basically spread by uh, insects like aphids or leaf hoppers. There's a few like tobacco mosaic virus that are spread mechanically with your fingers. You know, most of the tobacco is resistant to TMV, but apparently you can still get, you know, if you're a smoker or a dipper, and you work tomato plants, go out and prune your tomato plants. If you don't have TMV resistance in those tomato plants, uh, you can spread that around. Uh, most, most greenhouses that have workers in there will have people wash their hands before they go in there if they're tobacco users to make sure they don't spread this TMV. I don't have very many good pictures of it. It's not real common here. But one we have is this beet curly top. Occasionally, you'll see a plant here or there that just doesn't grow, the leaves roll up. It's not herbicide, because all the other plants around it look fine. But that's curly top virus. And you know, I've had this in my garden, and we had it really badly one year, about 10, 12 years ago. But usually it's just a plant here or there. But you'll see those leaves roll up, and the, and the veins on those leaves are purple. And that's a, a virus particle there, and that's the thing that spreads it. Doesn't really feed on the uh, tomato plants, but it just flies on there and see if it wants to, see if it's a suitable plant. So it'll taste the plant. If it doesn't like it, it'll move on and leave that curly top behind. And then of course we have nematodes. And these are the uh, round worms that live in soil. This is probably one of the biggest problems in tomato production in the state is uh, root knot nematode. And these are the eggs. And they'll just sit there waiting for a plant root. And when they sense or there's compounds that leach out of the plant root, 
it'll uh, cause these things to hatch. And if they hatch, uh, they'll, they'll feed on the plant. This was a trial from a long time ago we did uh, on, on root knot control. This was sandy ground. Nematodes really like sandy ground, but I've got, I've got bad root knot in my garden. And uh, it's not sandy, it's, uh, it's a loam. So uh, you can get it in all kinds of soil types. I, I had it ever since I bought this place 30 years ago. But uh, here's, here's some treatments we had out. This was nothing, obviously. This is pretty severe root knot pressure. And then we had, uh, this was back when you could get methyl bromide. We popped some methyl bromide cans under there. But really, we were, we were uh, testing these. Jim Motes was our extension uh, hort specialist. And he had uh, access to, he's growing these super hot chilies and the spent chili extract. They were looking for a way to get rid of it. So we incorporated it into the soil with a rototiller. And you can see we got some pretty decent control with that. Uh, uh, obviously, it wasn't as good as methyl bromide, but uh, uh, it had an effect, you know. And that's, that's organic matter. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And here it is in a hoop house. And if you pull out the roots, uh, you can see those galled up roots. Pretty easy to identify. And here's a, uh, this guy grew the best tomatoes of, the, of anybody I knew in Oklahoma, H.L. Staples. He was in Harrah, Oklahoma. He's passed away now, but he's, he was a retired dairy farm when he started truck farming there in Harrah. He could get size on tomatoes. But he grew a root knot susceptible variety one year and grew one with resistance side by side. And look at the difference there. Almost looks like he's uh, fumigated with methyl bromide, but that's simply a susceptible variety. And this is one with the MI gene. So if, if you buy a tomato variety, uh, it'll say uh, F for fusarium wilt, V for verticillium wilt. We don't have much of that here, fortunately. And uh, it'll say N for nematodes. And uh, the N for nematodes is the MI gene. That's uh, Meloidogyne incognita, which is the southern root knot nematode. Now, there are other ones that'll go to tomatoes. 90% of the root knot species that go to tomatoes, this MI gene is very effective on. I heard a presentation from a, a guy down in Florida that talked about the MI gene. Uh, most of the growers there don't take advantage of it because they fumigate for other things like fusarium wilt, but he's done some studies and, he, and he's shown that the MI gene down in Florida in that sandy soil that's loaded up with root knot is very effective. And it doesn't break, there's some uh, talk in the literature when it gets hot it loses its effectiveness. He claims that's not true. But uh, so uh, that's the best way to control root knot is to plant an N variety. So I'm going to talk a little bit about disease control and show you some results that we've been working on. Crop rotation, we, we, we heard a talk from uh, Tracy about IPM, and I'm going to reiterate some of these things. You know, crop rotation is good. You know, you want to keep your, your tomatoes and peppers uh, moved around with your grasses, onions, alliums, those are, those are good groups. Uh, tomatoes following like beans is not a good idea because of the root knot. Root knot's a tough thing to deal with, ro with rotation. Uh, it helps, but it's not a cure-all. Um, the other thing is residue management. When, you, when you're done with your tomatoes, and I'm bad about this, when you're done with your tomatoes, get them out of the field. Either plow them in or uh, carry them off. And uh, because the more of that residue and, and the stuff that lays on top of the soil is the stuff, is the residue that'll uh, support the most survival of, of both fungi and bacteria. When you bury it, it uh, decomposes quicker. And like a lot of those bacterial diseases, they're in that residue there. So if you're growing corn, for example, corn, uh, you know, we don't get a lot of leaf disease. I mean, we do on uh, field corn because it's out in the field for 90 days. But sweet corn, you know, is usually, well, it's 90 days, but, you know, you're picking uh, ears when it's still green uh, rather than drying it down. 
we, we don't have a lot of leaf diseases on corn. So you don't have to worry about the corn. But if you've got watermelons, squash, pumpkins loaded up with disease, that's the stuff you either want to pull it out, throw it in a compost pile somewhere, or uh, plow it in, rototill it in, disc it in, whatever, whatever way you can get it to start decomposing. Compost is a good way to, uh, nematodes don't like high levels of organic matter. They, uh, and a lot of your uh, wilt diseases don't either. You know, the more microbial activity you can get in the soil, so if you can add uh, compost, large amounts of compost, or do, do it over a, a long period of time, you're going to be uh, better off there, particularly on the nematode side. Um, healthy seed and transplants. You know, it, this is a hard thing because if you're buying your transplants or producing them yourself, a lot of times there'll be diseases there that you don't see and then you'll stick them out there, but try your best to get healthy looking transplants and, and produce and use high quality seed. When you start saving your own seed, you gotta find a way to disinfect it. A lot of these, these, a lot of these bacterial diseases are seed borne. They're carried in the seed. You saw those spots in the fruit so if you've got spots on your fruit and you extract the seed from there, you're gonna, probably going to have some bacteria on that seed. We use, typically they use Clorox, but there's other things that, that can be used. And these uh, disease resistant varieties are key in my opinion. And then uh, you've got to stake or cage those plants, uh, stake and weave or cage them to keep them off the ground. I recommend using drip irrigation. If you start sprinkling irrigating, you're going to spread a lot of diseases around. Try and avoid working the plants when they're wet. If you want to try and control these with a fungicide or a bactericide, you got to get on a preventive spray program and you need to, uh, I would recommend doing that before the problems start showing up. Typically around bloom, early fruit set, foliage looks good, start spraying then. Uh, another uh, approach to controlling some of these uh, root diseases like uh, fusariums that I showed you and the root knot are to, are to graft onto disease resistant root stock. And uh, NC State's got some pretty good fact sheets on tube grafting. Uh, you can go to that website there uh, or you can just Google grafting tomatoes and it'll take you right to NC State and they'll give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. Apparently it's not that difficult. I haven't tried it, but uh, um, there's rootstock varieties like from Johnny's, we were talking about that earlier, Maxi Fort. So if you want to grow heirlooms, for example, your heirlooms are not going to have nematode resistance and they're not going to have fusarium wilt. And if you start sticking them in the ground, you're going to run into these problems. If you're going to plant them in containers and change your potting mix each year, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just plant them in the containers. And, uh, but you need to change out that, that soil every year or, or every crop cycle because you're going to start running into those problems on heirlooms because they're super susceptible. Let me tell you about some of the work we've done. You know. Uh, Brett did a survey. Our main disease on tomatoes is this bacterial spot. So I, I recognized that a long time ago and put out this trial here at Bixby. Where we sprayed on seven day intervals for 10 applications. We started in May after they were transplanted and, and all the way to July. We used a fungicide, chlorothalonil. For, on a home brand, that would be called Ortho Garden Disease Control. You can find this at Lowe's. Uh, I, I see Stillwater Mills got a, a branch out here over there in Davis. You, you'll be able to find chlor, uh, small quantities of chlorothalonil. You can also find Mancozeb in small quantities sometimes. That's another protectant fungicide. And then we have the coppers. These are the ones that are active on bacteria copper hydroxide, copper sulfate. Uh, this is the Bordeaux mixture. This was the famous discovery of the grapevines back in the 1800s when grapevine downy mildew was wiping things out in France. Some guy had a pile of something, 
some copper and noticed that near this pile of copper, he didn't have downy mildew and start, they started working with this copper sulfate and they developed this Bordeaux mixture. That's where the name comes from. It's, they add lime to it to safen it. But if you add too much lime, it's not effective. But they've, they've got around that with some of these newer formulations. Well, I'll show you what we did. These are the materials that we tested. There were different combinations here. So we went Bravo by itself. And this was kind of a demonstration. I knew we had bacterial disease because I inoculated the plants with bacteria, okay? So I spiked this test. I was trying to show people that if you just spray this Bravo or chlorothalonil, it's not gonna work. And then we had coside, which is the copper, and then we had Mancozeb plus coside, and this is used in areas where they've got copper resistance in the bacteria. This helps free up more copper ion to make it more effective. And here I mix the two together, but you can't do this during, during harvest. You can't spray these mancozebs during harvest, so I switched to Bravo. This would be a, also be a situation, if you don't know if you have fun fungus or bacteria, you can mix the two together and just protect your plants as best you can. And then uh, we had uh, the same thing here. I don't know what the heck. Oh, we used Cooperfix instead of Coside. That's copper sulfate versus copper hydroxide. And then we had a non-treated check. So this is what the disease looked like. Bacterial spot, there's some more of it there. And really it wasn't all that bad. This is during uh, uh, fruit set there. You can see there's, we're losing quite a few of those lower leaves. And there's uh, sprayed versus unsprayed. And you, know, you can see the fruit there. But you know, these things are only partially effective, even if you start before you have the problem. So we still had some disease with the co-side, but you can see the Bravo didn't reduce it compared to the check, untreated check. And here's these alternations with Mancozeb plus co-side, Mancozeb plus Cooperfix, and then the untreated check. But, and here's where we got yield responses with the co-side. This, these were really high yielding tomatoes and, this, uh, and these uh, combination treatments where we switched to Bravo from Mancozeb halfway through because we were in the harvest period. So here's Coside plus Mancozeb, Bravo. Yeah, Coside plus Mancozeb, Coside plus Bravo. We switched halfway through. And here's uh, Mancozeb plus Cooperfix and uh, Bravo plus Cooperfix halfway through. So five sprays of each once a week. And there's our check. There's a harvest restriction on Mancozeb. You're not supposed to spray it within five to seven days of harvest. And you know, that time of year you're picking twice a week. So uh, we're just trying to follow the so label. Copper, you can pick. Yeah, you can, yeah. Right. A lot of these copper formulations, you have to check if you want to be organic, there's, there's quite a few of them that are certified OMRI. You can find copper, I'm not sure which ones they are, but if you go to the OMRI, O-M-R-I website, if you want to be organic, uh, uh, you can find those uh, copper formulations that are OMRI certified. Okay, and then Brett did some work this year. He wanted to try, he's interested in organic agriculture, and he wanted to try some of these biological treatments. And this is a long list of treatments here. But he planted Red Mountain on the 17th of May, right in the middle of all that rain. And these plants got off to a pretty slow start. But he started with this stuff called Actigard. It induces resistance in the plant. It is not organic. It's, it's expensive. And then these phage, these are uh, bacterial viruses that kill uh, bacteria. So we sent them some cultures. They produced the phage and sent them to us. And he sprayed that on there. He alternated it with Actigard, sprayed it by itself, or alternated it with a copper soap, Sueva, which is an Omri copper, altern in alternation. And then uh, he alternated Actigard with Coside, 
And then he put this double nickel out, which is a, a biological control. It's a bacillus. So it's uh, OMRI certified. Then he had agrophage by, then he alternated that with agrophage. And then uh, coside by itself. And then this is the coside plus diphane. He did not stop halfway through the year. He just kept going. Here's what he found in August. You know, it turned off hot and dry, boy, and he didn't get much disease. And then it kicked in really late in the year. The only thing that reduced, here's the check, about nearly 50% defoliated. The Actigard coside, the agrophage by itself, the coside by itself, and then that coside diphane or mancozeb mixture. Those were the ones that gave the best control. Unfortunately, yield-wise, uh, didn't get an effect there. These yields were not as good as, uh, as that previous trial. They were only about a quarter of the yield of that trial at Bixby. This ground's pretty tight there in Stillwater. They went through some adverse conditions because he had them out there transplanted before we had all that heavy rain. See this trial here, you know, we were 50, uh, 40,000 pounds an acre. You know, that's a lot of tomatoes. Yeah. The ground has a lot to do with that. That's silt loam soil at Bixby. That's good ground. On bacteria, I think if, if you had fungi, you know, and sprayed with Bravo, you'd probably get better results. Bacteria are very hard to control. I did show that the Bravo is not effective for bacterial disease control, and these are the, the most effective ones, but our yield responses were variable. You know, there's, there's several approaches. You can, you can go into all these trials here, and here's the untreated check. You know, there's 10,000 pounds of tomatoes. You go into this one. There's 30,000 pounds of tomatoes, marketable tomatoes, unsprayed. So you can, you can live with the disease. Uh, it'll cut your harvest period short. You may get a little more culls from sunburn, but you'll still make tomatoes. These, the, the, neither one of the, the speck or the spot are going to wipe you out. But if you want to maximize, this is when you need to get into a spray program. Spider mites, you know. If you're going to grow tomatoes, you've got to keep an eye out for these things. Lynn Brandenburg told me he tried this crop oil. He uses a hose end sprayer and puts uh, horticultural oil out there. But you've got to be careful with that. You can fry the heck out of tomatoes with, with oil in the summertime. Mm -hmm.